Welcome to Strength for the Journey. Thanks for joining us again. Strength for the Journey is a radio program designed to strengthen the believer for the days that lie ahead. We have a website at strength with a number four the journey.com. That's strength with a journey for the journey with the number four. And this is radio program number 44. If you're listening by shortwave radio, there's a lot of new things happening right now. And I just want to share some of the things that are going on right here in Panama. This last weekend, uh, I was a part of a, a large event. It was a conference of men um, all across Panama. It was a uh, what they just call a Ferdeva conference. It's the men's ministry for the Assembly of God Church here. And it was a very interesting message. I had the first uh, message. Um, I was the first speaker. And the Lord put on my heart to speak about our death to self and that uh, the death is what initiates a new life. And this message, um, the Lord's been really speaking to me uh, because really a born again process only begins with death. It has to begin with death. And that's the death that we come to ourselves and we realize that, uh, that, that we can do nothing without him. And uh, the Lord even said, you cannot follow me unless you deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me. So this is the initiation stage of our life with him is our death to ourself. And the next, uh, one of the things I shared about too was um, that the Lord has spoken to me a while back about how he wants to raise up an army. And this is a, a unique army that the Lord wants to raise up. It's an army of dead men that don't fear man. They don't fear the devil and they don't fear the times that they live in. And this is an army that God wants to put together to do a work that he wants to do, that he wants to get all the glory with the things that he's going to do in the future, that that playtime is over and that man's glory is going to come to an end, that, that the ministries that have glorified themselves and, uh, and really left the Lord out um, of the glory of what he wants to do is, is going to change now. And God's looking for men who will literally lay down their life for him. One thing that the Lord re-asked a question to me, he asked me many years ago if I would would be willing to die for him, and I said I would. But about two years ago, he changed the wording of that question to me, um, and he asked me, will I die for him? And then I was just broken, just weeping, but I knew that he was asking me a very serious question. And what he was asking me was, whether I would be willing to lay it all down, including my life. And it, it was almost like he was saying, well, now is the time you have to make this decision. And I said I would. And from that point on, many things changed. And I almost feel like there was a, a depth of relationship that I'd never experienced before, that, that it's almost like he was saying, okay, now I can trust you. Now I can trust you with what I want to do with your you and your life. And I think this is really a question that many of us avoid. Um, we avoid that question of, of death. Um, but if we realize, um, kind of like what Peter said when many disciples walked away from the Lord in chapter 6 of John, he looked over to the 12 and he said, well, are you going to leave me too? And, he, and Peter said, well, where am I going to go? Uh, where are we going to go? Because only you have the words of life. And I think that ability to come to that conclusion was because they had already forsaken all. That the disciples, the other disciples uh, that the, the um, chapter 6 describes, they really hadn't left all. They were just there for pretty much free food because Jesus challenged them when they showed up after he fed the 5,000. They showed up on the other side of the lake and he said that you're not here because of the miracles. You're here because I fed you yesterday. And then he said, we'll try this little meal on, you know, unless you drink the, uh, eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And, And they said, well, who can receive this hard saying? And they said they walked away and no longer walked with him. And I just wonder if this is kind of like where the rubber meets the road. Um, Can we receive a hard word from the Lord? Can we accept it? Can we eat it? Even though it may be bitter, can we eat it? 
I keep thinking about Ezekiel, how he had to eat the whole scroll before he could deliver the message. And I've been thinking about the fact that it was sweet to his taste when he ate it. And I'm wondering if that is because he just wanted to hear the Lord's voice. It didn't matter what, he, what the Lord said to him, what the word was. He was willing to eat it and willing to consume it. And I think that's where all of us need to be right now is that we need to be hungry enough for the word of God, for what he's trying to say to us, that it doesn't matter how bitter or how sweet it is, how pleasant it is or how unpleasant it is, how difficult it is to hear or how easy it is to hear. We need to be able to receive any word. You know, Jesus said that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I think this is really where our hearts have to be right now. We just have to say, Lord, I don't care what you want to say to me. Just say something to me. About two years ago, when I had an amazing experience, um, I was just asleep one night, and I woke up, and the Lord began to speak to me. And his presence was so real in my room, I, I felt like he was just sitting on the edge of my bed. And... When this happened, I said to him afterwards, I said, Lord, I was just in, I was just bathed in tears because his presence was so incredible. But I, I longed for that presence, and I said, Lord, you can wake me up anytime you want if you have something that you want to say to me. And it was like, okay, I'll take you up on that. And I normally don't ever sleep through the night there's some time during the night I'll wake up before the sun rises because I, I know he wants to speak to me and he wants to speak to all of us. There's a presence that God wants to bring into our life, but many times his presence, it's a holy presence. And when you really come into that presence, you realize that you're not so holy. And this is the message the Lord has really been speaking to me lately is that he's coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming for a bride that is so hungry for his presence that it doesn't matter whether he comes with a rebuke or he comes with a praise. If he comes with a kick on the shin or a pat on the back, we just want to know it's his hand upon us. And some of the words the Lord has been speaking to me lately um, really are in the sense that he's trying to prepare us for the things to come. And we have to be able to receive any word and every word that comes from his mouth because the times that are getting ready to come upon us, we're going to have to be prepared, not only in our hearts, but also physically. We need to be where he wants us to be. And so many of us right now have become so comforted and so comfortable where we are that, that we won't budge, that we have our stakes so deeply put into the ground that if the cloud begins to move, we're going to stay put because we've established our nest so so uh, securely. And the Lord said something to me a couple of years ago before we made a move to a foreign land. He said that I either leave my comfort zone or my comfort zone will leave me. And I think we've come to that point right now that many comfort zones are going to be going away, that many people that have put their stakes so deeply in the ground they can't be budged um, we're going to wish they had not had such deep roots. But I got a word the other day, and, and this is, um, I have it posted on Strength for the Journey uh, on the Today's Rhema link. And it says, who will, take, who will the Lord take care of and preserve during the coming time of testing? Will it be the prepared or the presumptuous? Will it be the obedient or the disobedient? Will it be the awake or the asleep? Right now, a voice is crying out, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It is crying in the wilderness because the voice has been rejected in the city and in the marketplace. The voice, voices have been rejected by the multitudes and now has gone out into the highways and byways to compel anyone to come with ears to hear and a heart to obey. Many today have presumed they are God's children, but have no fruit to prove that they are truly God's child. They are only filled with rebellion and idolatry, proving that they have a different father. They claim God will take care of us, not even knowing the God they speak of. The God they claim to know is not the same God they think they know. 
The God they claim to know is a righteous and holy God who requires righteousness and holiness from his children. Those who claim to know him don't know that they are the children of the God they serve. Worldly children serve the God of this world. Only by acknowledging the error of their ways, repenting and turning from their wicked ways, will I protect them from what is to come. If they refuse to listen and repent and turn, then demise and destruction is their own doing and not mine. I have come to judge sin on the earth and all those who refuse to let go of it. The hour is late, and the voice is now in the wilderness crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Will you refuse to hear and yield, because you say in your heart, I need not prepare? I am a child of the king. My father is Abraham. I am, we are his seed. Is that your final answer? Because your time is almost up. If you can't let go of what you are and who you are, if you cannot let go of what you have and what has you, then you have demonstrated your gods and false idols. Will your reputation save you in the hour of testing? Will your possessions? Who can save you in that hour? Your sense of security is false. Your sense of values is false. Your sense of direction is false because you have believed a lie. Your only hope is to repent and then cry out for mercy because the hour of mercy is nearly over. The time is nearly here when your cries for mercy will not be heard. Though you cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear you. The hour of judgment is almost here, and still you, you refuse to turn from your wicked ways and your false idols. Your love for this world is your demonstration of your lack of love for me. Your lack of love for me will be demonstrated when you shake your fist and curse the heavens. Is it not within your heart to repent even at this late hour? Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The King is coming. This is a word that is posted on October 30th. And these are not easy words to receive, nor are they easy words to give. But I know that the Lord is crying right now for a voice that will speak the truth, that will tell the truth that people that are hungry for the truth can be fed. I didn't ask for this job. I merely moved at the Lord's direction and at that point that I began to walk in obedience is that that is the point in time when God began to first change me and many years ago I wanted to go change the world and I was just on fire I traveled with an evangelistic ministry and I was just uh, like a man on fire and I wanted to go change the world and the Lord grabbed me by the neck collar and he said he said whoa son he said uh, he said you're never going to change anybody the only guy you'll ever change is the guy you see in the mirror every morning. But the changes you allow me to make in you, I will use to change others. And he began to show me that I was like a seed, and we're all like seeds, that we can only reproduce after our own kind. We can only reprodu reproduce in other people what we already are. We can't reproduce in others what we desire to be or what we are our greatest hopes of what we will achieve. We reproduce after our own kind. And that's why all of us really need to examine what we see in the mirror right now. Because we can't point the finger at anybody else. We can't point the finger and blame anybody else for our shortcomings. That we have to really look in the mirror and say, Lord, I'm the only one I can change. I'm the only one that I have the power to control. And this is what the Lord is saying right now to all of us. And I want to play a song here in just a moment. It's a song by Hillsong, and it's called, With All I Am.
worship brings brokenness in us. This is a place where God wants all of us to be right now, is in just a place, place of brokenness and humility and literally falling at his feet and saying, Lord, I can't do this without you. I can't make this without you. There are things that are coming upon the earth that are going to bring great fear upon many. And we better have our foundation in place. We better have our entire life and our entire existence founded upon the rock, the only one that can save us. Our stuff can't save us. Our reputation can't save us. Nothing can save us but the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we'll fall at his feet, broken and humble before him and worship him and put him first above everything else, that we will put ourselves in a position of protection. I've been questioning a lot of things lately about our security and, and how are we really that secure? Do we really believe? Do we really understand? Do we really understand really what it means to believe? Many people think that believing just means that you have acknowledged an historical fact that Jesus is the Christ. But that doesn't really mean that you believe. The Greek word for believe means that you trust. And it really means that you trust so much that you obey. If Jesus said that we are to do something or said that we are not to do something, really to believe means that you trust his word so much that you will obey what he says that we're supposed to do or not supposed to do. And this is what really defines a real true believer, is the action of our belief. If we claim to merely believe, but we don't have the fruit to follow, we don't have the actions in our life to demonstrate that we really believe, then we are really just fooling ourselves. And all of us are going to have to stand before the Lord, and many of us possibly before we realize. We have to really examine our lives right now and find out really where are we in this relationship one of the things I've been asking the Lord is, how do we know if we're his bride? Because this is really where the rubber meets the road, is many that were virgins that were keeping themselves pure, there's only half of them were allowed to come in, and the other half were not, because some were prepared and some weren't. And in this kind of questioning, I've been asking the Lord because I'm asking for myself. I don't want to be deceived. And so I have this, I wrote this the other day, and I've been asking the Lord. I said, Lord, how do we know with your, where your bride? And he woke me up with this word. He said, how do you know if you're my bride? I'm the first thing on your mind when you wake up in the morning and the last thing on your mind when you go to bed at night. You don't just say you love me you're in love with me. You don't just love me in word, you love me in deed. Are you really in love with me? What is the first thing on your mind when you wake in the morning and the last thing on your mind when you go to bed at night? Is it your work or your pleasure? Is it what you have or what you don't have? Is it the world or is it me? Is it your life or is it mine? You may claim to love me, but are you in love with me? Am I the, your treasure or is the world? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Identify your treasure now, for everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The very foundations of men's lives are about to be shaken to test what they've been made of. Everything not founded upon the rock will be washed away. Many men's lives have been built upon sand. Am I the foundation of your life? Have you built your life upon an eternal and lasting foundation? or a world-loving temporal foundation. Check your lamp. Now is the time. Are you sure you have enough oil? Darkness is coming. Only those who hear now will see later. Will you be among those lost in the dark, or will you find your way? My bride just doesn't just say she loves me. She is in love with me. She loves my voice and every word that proceeds from my mouth. She responds when I call her, and she will follow me anywhere. My bride has made herself ready. And this is a word that's posted on September 30th. And then 
recently I've been considering um, some other thoughts that I had about whether or not we're really there, where we really um, do have a relationship with the Lord, and we really trust Him with all of our hearts. And, and this is a something else that I've, this is posted on October 20th, but I've been asking the Lord for more evidence and indicators that we are His bride. I don't want to be deceived thinking or assuming that I am His bride only to find out later that I'm not after it's too late, just like the first foolish virgins did in Matthew chapter 25. How do we really know that we're the bride of Christ? If you really wanted to marry someone, would you not do all you could to be pleasing to them? Would you not do all you could to become the person they desired to be with? Would you not do this if you really desire to be with them? The beauty of becoming the bride of Christ isn't that we're competing with another person to be his bride. We're competing with the person we were yesterday. We're competing with the person we used to be as we die daily, as we die to self and our old nature. The old nature that desired to live for self, promote self, and please self. Each new day, we must deal with our attitudes and actions that didn't, didn't demonstrate and manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the character of Jesus. Each day we must deal with our attitudes and actions that demonstrated our desire to please ourself and not our Heavenly Father. If Jesus lived His life in such a way to please His Heavenly Father, shouldn't we, if we are to be His bride? If the Father who dwells in the heavens declared from the heavens, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased, doesn't it make sense that He desires to declare the same thing about His Son's bride? Who do you think will preside over Jesus' wedding? Will Jesus preside over His own wedding, or will another? If in this earthly realm the Father of the groom must approve of the bride, the Father of Jesus must do the same. This is why, as the bride of Christ, we must live our lives in such a way to please our Heavenly Father. This is one more bit of evidence to indicate if we are truly His bride. This is the question that we really have to ask right now. God is really trying to give us indicators that we can check ourselves and see where we really are with this relationship that we have, that we claim to have with Him. Is our heart truly desiring to please Him with all of our heart? See, that's what Jesus had a desire to please His Heavenly Father with all of His heart. And because of that desire, He was enabled. And I believe that if we have that desire to please God with all of our heart, that we are that as well. And this is the question all of us must ask. In James 4, eight and 4.7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God is looking for a pure heart. He is looking for someone who's desiring with all of his heart to please his heavenly Father. And this word was spoken to the church, so this was not a word to the world. This is a word to the church. So this is the time now to examine our hearts and really find out, Lord, where am I right now? So thank you so much for joining us on Strength for the Journey. Again, Strength for the Journey's website is strength with the number four, thejourney.com, and we'll see you next time.